Spirit, send me past the living. Father, we thank you for this morning, Lord. Thank you. God, for your goodness to us. Thank you for your presence in this place. Father, we just pray now, God, would you open our eyes to see whatever it is that we need to see here this morning, God. Holy Spirit, you know each person in this room intricately, inside and out. God, you know every question on their heart. You know everything in their mind. You know the, the, the wrestlings, the, the struggles, Lord. You know all that stuff. And Father, I pray this morning, God, speak to each person in a language that they would understand. And take us one step further today on that journey towards intimacy with you and freedom from all the stuff that would hold us back. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Okay, I, I may not get through all of this today now, but we'll see how we go. Um, everyone have a look at this box. Everybody seen the... Oh, where's the box gone? Oh, Luke's got the box up the back. Okay, now just so you know, we were so serious about confidentiality with what was in that box that I threw away the key. And so, so Luke is cutting the, the lock open because I, I, we told you we're serious about confidentiality. So I threw away the key. That's not true. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for conviction. I lost it. I lost it. I came in here this morning and realized it was four weeks and I haven't got my key. I checked my car, checked up there, can't find the key. But maybe the Holy Spirit took it away from me and maybe it was transported like Stephen was after, uh, the, you know, uh, sorry, Philip after the baptism of the Ethiopian eunuch. Yeah, I lost it in the cash runner. Thanks, Shelley. Appreciate the humility. So anyway, we've been looking at, in that box, we've been looking at, we started a journey about four weeks ago. And we, this is the end of four weeks. And I told you that today, after four weeks, what we're going to do, everything that you wrote in that box, people got sheets of paper, wrote down. And, and the question was this, what area in 2024, what area of your life do you need to change in? Not what area do you want to change in. That's very, very different. We've all got areas where we want to change to make our life a bit better, to make us fitter, healthier, whatever. But there are areas of our life that we, we, we might not feel like we want to change, but we need to. Because if we don't, that's going to catch up with us and there's going to be very bad consequences in our life. If we don't get a grip on that area of our life, down the track, consequence is going to slap us up the side of the head. And maybe when that consequence catches up with me, some types of consequences in some people's lives, once consequence gets you, you don't get a chance to go back and have a second and third chance. So what's that area of your life where you know that you need to change? Not where you want to, where you need to. And if you don't change before you have to, you'll be forced to change because you have to. And so we got everybody to write that down on a piece of paper and they put it in a red toolbox here that they're madly trying to cut the lock off up the back now. And um, in that box, we've been coming in for four weeks. We've been praying over that box. People have been coming in, not just us, and uh, ringing up, I want to come in, can I pray? And they've been coming in and praying over that box each week. We've been praying over it. And we've been talking about different aspects and things so that we can make 2024 the year where we say no more to whatever that thing is, whatever's holding us back in that box. Amen. We want to break free of that stuff. We want to be set free. We want to be delivered. We don't want that stuff to hold us back anymore. And some of that stuff could have been in your life from the time you were that big. You're going to blow it up. He's taking the box outside. Must have an explosive or something. It was only a little lock. I don't know. Bring it here. I'll just... Anyone ever heard of the serenity prayer? Can we put that up on the board there? You got the slides there, mate? There we go. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. There was an American theologian, Reinhold Neuber, who penned this prayer, and it's a very famous prayer now, and it's, it's prayed often in recovery groups and so on, used all around the world. Give me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. How many of you know there are some things in your life you cannot change? I cannot change the fact that I'm 51 years old, turning 52 this year. I can't change that. I don't know. I look about 25. I cannot change the fact that my hair is the way it is and that every morning I get out of bed, look at my hair and say, Jackie, I just want to shave it off. I've, 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 I, want to, yeah. I want to look like some other men in the church. But my wife assures me, Alan, you have a head shaped like a golf ball. It will look stupid. And she's a hairdresser by background, so I'm happy to trust her. So I have to wake up every day with this. But I can't change that. You know, it's, it's what I've got. Um, there are other things in my life that I can't change and there's stuff in your life that you can't change and God gives us a serenity saying give me the peace, the grace to accept the stuff that I cannot change. Thank you. Get it off. Oh, the padlock's still on. You just busted the... 
That's okay. doesn't matter. There's more than one way to skin a cat, they say. Not that I'm encouraging skinning cats. I love cats. Don't do that. Don't someone take that on YouTube and flip it, and which people do. There are things we can't change, but how many of you know there are things you can change? There are things we can change in our life. In other words, there are things that we can do. Even with the things I can't change, there are usually some things I can do about the thing I can't change. I love, uh, I, I love where Paul prays. Remember that passage where Paul says, I had this, this, this thorn in my flesh, right? And now nobody knows what the thorn in the flesh was. He just says, this thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan. All we know is it wasn't from God, it wasn't good, but it was something in his life. And he said, I prayed three times to the Lord. I said, Lord, take this away. And after the third time, the Lord spoke to him and said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. Amen? So, so while he couldn't, he couldn't remove that thing, what he could do was he prayed. He prayed and he sought God, and God gave him a word. So even the things that you can't do anything about, there's something you can do about as well, if that makes sense. And so what we're going to talk about now is what are some practical things in the little bit of time we got, what are some practical things we can start doing now? So we've talked about what's the need. We put it in the box. The next week we talked about motivation because I knew that we're going to need a bit of motivation, so we looked at some points of motivation. Then last week we looked at accountability, the importance and power of making yourself accountable to somebody, not just God, but somebody for breaking through and doing what I need to do for the sake of what's in that box. This week we're going to get practical and put some legs on some practical things that we can do to play our role, what's some of the stuff that we can do to break ourselves free, to work with the Holy Spirit and work with the power of God to see ourselves get free of some of this stuff. What's the part we play in our own breakthrough? Very quickly, number one, stop giving power to excuses. Stop giving power to excuses. I'll guarantee you, every single one of us have a reason why we cannot break free from that thing. Yet you still felt the Lord speak to you about it. And you still got up and you still wrote it down, you still put it in there. But I'll guarantee you that when it gets difficult and hard, what comes to mind is all the reasons why I should just give up and just let it go. All the reasons why I should just accept this is my lot in life. It's not a lot, but it's a life. I should just accept it and just roll with it. And we've got to get to a point in our life where we take authority over our own self and we stop giving power to excuses. In, in John chapter 5, verse 5 to 8, Jesus has this interesting encounter. It says, one who was there, this is at the pool of Bethesda, where all the, the sick people would go, and they believed that an angel would stir the waters. And the first person in the waters would be healed. This was the belief. Now, one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he'd been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? What an interesting question to ask a guy. It says Jesus saw him there. He knew he'd been an invalid for 30-something years, and he knew he'd been there waiting for a while. Yet Jesus' first question, first question was, do you actually want to get well? Interesting. Do you actually want to get well? You know, you can look like you want to get well. You can be listening to the podcast. You can be sitting in a counselor's office every week and still not want to get well. You can, be, you, can, you can be ticking all the boxes. You can be making the phone calls. You can be going to a recovery group. You can be doing whatever it is. You can have accountability, motivation, but still actually not really want to get well. You can look the part without actually being the part. I mean, this man's... There, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I'm going, Jesus, what are you... What, hang on. How dare you ask him that question? This guy is there. He's at the pool. He's been there for a while. Of course he wants to get better. He's in the right place. He's doing the right stuff. All the sick people are gathering. But Jesus still says to him, do you, do you actually want to get well? Do you really want to get well? And then he says, sir, here's his answer. I've got no one to help me into the pool when the water's stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me, blah, blah, blah. Instead of just going, yes, I want to get well, straight to excuses. Oh, well, someone beats me in there and this. But you know what? I was thinking about this and I'm thinking, you know what? That's not a bad question, Jesus, because if I was that man, you know what I would do? If that was the pool of Bethesda, I'd be laying on my side about an inch above it waiting and the, and the first trickle, bang, I'd roll in. And then they'd all laugh at me and go, a leaf fell off a tree, you dummy. I don't care. I'd get out and I'd lay back on the edge like this waiting. I would be the closest person to the pool, hanging over the top of it, hovering, waiting for the moment. That's what, I would, that's what, you, that's what you would do if you really, really wanted to get well. And I'm sure he wanted to get well, but he was also happy and comfortable empowering some of the excuses in his life as to why that couldn't happen. But what I love about him is that Jesus then turns to him after hearing his excuse, and Jesus says, get up, take your mat and walk. 
And in response to the word of Jesus, it's like all the excuses disappeared. And he said, okay. And somehow he got to his feet. And somehow he starts walking off. He gave the word of God precedence over his excuses. He finally got to a point where he laid down his excuse. I wonder, that guy could have been sitting there till the day he died. Had he not decided that he was going to stop believing the excuses and just do what God was telling him to do. Jesus said, just get up and walk. Now, I know it sounds ludicrous and crazy to me, but it's, it's, it's here, it's recorded. Apparently it happened, I believe it. And in the same way today, God spoke to you and said, put this thing in there. God spoke to you and said, you need to change in this area. But it can be so easy to get to a point where we come up with all kinds of excuses and reasons. And we just, before you know it, 2024 finishes and you're in the same place you started. Just because you put a a letter in a box, just because people are praying over it, just because we got some motivation and just because we might have made ourselves accountable to somebody, still is no guarantee. Do you want to be free? Do you want to be free? Are you prepared to do the work? See, a lot of people say, I want freedom, but we're just not prepared to do the work that we've got to do to get there. We're not prepared. We're just not prepared because it's hard work. This man's an invalid for 38 years. He positioned himself near a pool. He's trying to get in when the water stirs, but Jesus says, do you want to get well? See, whatever excuses I empower in my life, those excuses will take me to a place I most likely don't want to be. And here's the thing with excuses. Quite often, an excuse begins with a valid reason, doesn't it? I've got valid reasons why I should be a different type of person than I am now. I've got valid reasons why I should not be be living the life I'm living now. When I go back and look at my background and my upbringing, when I go back and look at what was modelled to me, when I go back and look at what happened, I I have valid reasons to not be the person that I am today. And I'm not saying that as they look at me. I'm, please, don't look at me. Look at Jesus, right? But the point I'm making is this. If you take a valid reason, which we all have, and you lean too heavily on the valid reason, you turn that valid reason into an excuse. And when you turn that valid reason into an excuse, what you do when you make an excuse is you give up responsibility, personal responsibility or power to be able to do anything about that because it's somebody else's fault or something else's fault. Or some, uh, and and you, you give up personal responsibility, therefore you actually become a victim to something that if you just lent off, if you didn't allow that reasonable excuse, that reasonable reason, that if you you pulled yourself off that and didn't allow that to become an excuse, you would realize you actually have some sense of power and authority and, and ability to respond, which is what responsibility is. It's the ability to respond, isn't it? It's the ability to respond. Matthew 25, the parable of the talents. Who's read that story? You would have read that story a thousand times if you'd been in church for a while. The, the, the master's going away, and so he gets these guys together. You can read it in Matthew 25. And, and he gives five talents to one person, or five dollars, let's say. And he gives two dollars to another person, and one dollar to another person. And the person with the five bucks goes and does something with it, comes back, the master doubles it. The person with the two dollars goes away, does something with it, master comes back, doubles it. The person with the one dollar goes away, buries it in the ground. When the master comes back, says, I did this because of you. I couldn't do anything with this because of you. You're a hard man and you you, you don't treat people fairly and so on. He used an excuse. Now, I I love in that parable the the $2 man. I I, I want to be, I feel like the $2 man. I don't have the five talents. I wasn't given the five talents. See, here's the thing. Most of us in life, you had no control over what you started with. The master gave them what they had. They had no control over what they started with but they had all the control over where they were going to finish. They took what they had. One man made an excuse and lost what he had. The other two went out there and did something with it. The $2 man could have sat back and gone, oh, woe is me. Why did he get five and I only got two? That's unfair and that's my reason. Why. You got a better start than me and you, you got better role models than me. And you got... He could have done that, but he didn't. He didn't. He took the two that he had and he put the two to work. And guess what? At the end of that, he got another two back to him, so all of a sudden he had four. All of a sudden he had four. He made some progress. He went forward. The guy that that leant onto onto the reason and turned it into an excuse, he went backwards. The master came and took even what he had away from him, and it wasn't a good ending for that guy. And some of us... Some of us have just got to make the decision, stop listening to and believing and empowering excuses in your life as to why you cannot change. We believe so many lies. 
We've got a God in heaven saying, I want to set you free. I've got plans for you, purposes, good things. I want to give you an abundant life. But we sit there and we give in to the power of some of these excuses. As soon as we start bowing to the power of excuse, we, take, we abdicate personal responsibility and we put it out there. If I'm going to change, you have to change first. If I'm going to uh, uh, get better in this, then, then that has to happen. or that needs, And everything becomes external. Well, you can't control anything external. You can only control this. You can only control this. That's the difference between being a victim or living as a victor. It's not about whether you have a crown on your head, uh, gold on your fingers and $1,000. It's day-to-day choices that we make in a mentality. Am I going to abdicate responsibility and lean into those reasons and make them excuses or am I going to make the decision to stand up and go, you know what, yeah, life hasn't been fair. Yeah, some things happened that I... Most of the stuff, the stuff I put in that box actually had nothing to do with me. If I'm brutally honest, the, 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 the origins, the genesis of the stuff I put in that box had, was out of my control totally, nothing to do with me. I, I, didn't, I would never have chosen it because I know that if, if I chose that, I'd probably end up where I am in those areas. I would never have picked that. But what am I going to do? Every time that voice comes up and goes, well, it wasn't your fault, it was somebody else's. You know? well, you, you're 51 now, you probably only, you've got less life ahead of you than probably do behind you, so just suck it up and deal with it now. No, 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 God spoke to me and said, I need to change. Amen? He said, I need to change. And we've got to stop empowering excuses in our life. Think about this. By June this year, by June this year, you can have six months of excuses behind you or you can have six months of progress in front of you. What do you want? Do you want six months of excuses behind you or do you want six months of progress? Do you want to be standing in a place knowing that... See, see, here's the thing. It doesn't matter. When it comes to change, it's not about the speed. We're so caught up on speed. I'm not changing quick enough. I'm not, going, I'm not getting rich quick enough. I'm not, it's got nothing to do with speed and everything to do with direction. Everything to do with direction. People look at the speed of their change and transformation and give up, throw the towel in because it's not happening quick enough for them. You know what? Don't worry about speed. Worry about direction. Are you heading in the right direction that you need to go? Baby steps, one after the other, after the other. Are you heading in the right direction? That's what matters. Don't worry about speed. Speed kills. Speed kills, not just practically, physically, spiritually, trying to run ahead too fast, trying to skip the process to get freedom and restoration and deliverance in your life, trying to skip the process and just, my wife hates, we were having this chat the other day, I love the process. We've got a backyard and I've got trees and weeds and everything and, and, and you know, Jackie would love to, you know, we are talking about, why don't we just get a gardener in and he can come and do it all in one day? I'm like, no, I enjoy the process. And Jackie's like, I don't like the process. I just want the end result when it comes to the yard and, and all that sort of stuff. And when it comes to freedom and deliverance, you know what? We've got to embrace the process. We've got to embrace the process and walk with God. We've got to embrace the process. And first thing is stop empowering excuses in our lives. Very quickly, we'll move on. Craig Groeschel, actually, Craig Groeschel, he once said this. He said, you can have excuses or you can have progress, but you can't have both. You can have excuses or you can have progress, but you can't have both. Second thing, I want to move on real quick. Second thing, you've got to accept the pain and discomfort of change. Accept the fact that change has a certain level of pain and a large degree of discomfort when it comes to change. Okay? Change is not something people naturally like. The truth is this, most people don't change until the pain of staying the same becomes greater than the pain of change. Here I am in my life right now, I need to change. But if I change, the the pain of being here, but if I change, it's going to be that much pain, so I'll stay exactly where I am. Until one day, the pain of staying the same becomes greater than the pain of change, and then they go, oh, I'll change now, because it alleviates the pain. But you know what that is? That's changing because you have to, not before you have to. It's changing because you have to. We're talking about changing before we have to. And we need to accept the fact that change, the change we need to make is going to come with a certain level of resistance in our life. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 says this. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with what? Perseverance. Let us run with perseverance. That word perseverance tells me something. It tells me that I'm going to get tired, it tells me there's going to be some kind of resistance, some kind of wind blowing back. It tells me it's not going to be easy. Exactly right. If I'm going to run the race that Jesus wants me to run, it's not going to be without its resistance. 
There's going to be resistance. And when it comes to personal change and changing that stuff in that box, there is going to be resistance. And you are going to need perseverance if you're going to run that race. Change requires you to step into a space that feels unnatural. To not be that person would suddenly feel unnatural. Although you don't want to be that, held back by that, to not have that would all of a sudden feel somewhat unnatural to you. Because some of us, that's been part of our whole life story. Some people find identity in some of this stuff, don't they? Some people find identity in the dysfunction and the bondages and so on. And if they break free of that, well, who, who am I then? Who am I then? No longer am I that, that, that broken person. No longer am I that, that you know, what, what happens to me? And sometimes people find their identity in that kind of stuff. But if you're going to change whatever you're going to have to do to break free of that, I'll guarantee you, you're going to step into a space that's going to feel somewhat unnatural. When I was young uh, and, and, and playing rugby, I remember my rugby coach one day, uh, I, I could pass from right to left, bang, easy, all day, all day, all day. But because of my position, he said, you've got to learn to pass left to right. Now, that was really, really awkward, really, really gammy. But what he would do is we'd go to training, and while everybody was running laps getting fit, he'd have me on the ground, grab the ball, I'd have to pass 100 passes that way. And then when I was done, he said, now turn around, throw 100 perfect passes that way. So while they're running, I'm, and it just was awkward. My body's in the wrong spots. It felt unnatural. I felt like an idiot. Everyone's running around laughing. This guy can't even pass that way, you know? It was terrible, embarrassing, difficult. felt so unnatural. But then by the game time, I'd thrown 200 passes that way by the time we got there to the game. And over a period of time, by the end of that season, I could throw as comfortably one way as I could the other way. But it was an unnatural process, and my arm got really sore and tired because I'm just not used to throwing that way all the time, and it was, it was not comfortable at all. But you keep going, you keep going, you keep doing it, and eventually, that becomes more natural for you. So it might feel unnatural to say no to KFC and yes to a salad. But if you need to, for the sake of your body, just do it. It might feel unnatural to say sorry to your spouse or listen more and talk less. But if you need to for the sake of your marriage, do it. It might feel unnatural to decide to stick to a budget or to live within your financial means, spend less than you earn. But if you need to for the sake of your financial well-being and future, just do it. Just do it. It might feel unnatural to say no to the television and yes to prayer or the Bible. But if you need to for the sake of your spiritual life, hey, guess what? Just do it. Do it. It might feel unnatural and uncomfortable, but do it. It might feel unnatural to lay aside your pride and choose to humbly embrace accountability, but if you need to for the sake of a breakthrough, do it. Do it. Do it. You have more authority over this than you realize. You have more authority over this than you realize. Don't live like a victim. Live like a victor. Number three, really quick, moving on. Prayerfully write out a plan. Prayerfully write out a plan. What are you actually going to do practically now? Motivated, got my accountability. I'm embracing the fact that there's going to be some pain. I'm going to deny my excuses. Now, what am I going to actually do now? What am I going to do? Get with God and write out a plan. I love this promise in James chapter 1, 5 and 6. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should what? Should what? Ask who? Sounds a lot like prayer, doesn't it? Hey? I mean, you can talk to your neighbours about it. That's fine. You can, you can go to a counsellor about it. I'm encourage all that sort of stuff. But I think the starting point is this. Why don't you start by talking to God about it? Why don't you go to God and say, okay, God, this is, that, this is the deal. Rubber meets the road now, God. I've got to come up with an action plan here. It's one thing to put a letter in a box. It's one thing to pray. It's one thing to get accountability. It's one thing to be motivated. It's one thing to accept the pain. It's another thing to deny excuses. Now I've got to put rubber on the road and I've got to start moving forward. So he says, if any of you lack wisdom, ask God who gives what? Generously to who? Hands up if you think you're an all. Some of you are struggling with that one. I'll, let you, I'll tell you what all means in the English language. All. All means everybody in this room, if you, are, if you need wisdom, and if you're going to make a plan, here's my encouragement to you, pray, ask God for wisdom. God, give me wisdom. What do I do? Who do I go? Where do I? What, what the, ask God for wisdom. And sit down prayerfully, get a pen out, bit of paper, say, okay, God, let's do a bit of a roadmap to freedom in 2024. Practically now, what can I do, God? I'm going to bring you into the process, and I'm not just going to pray to God and then go away and seek every... No, I'm going to pray to God, and he goes on. He says, but when you ask, believe and don't doubt. 
Believe in, I'm going to ask in faith, God. I'm inviting you into this space. God, by the way, you're the one that said I need to change. Amen? You're the one that spoke into my heart four weeks ago and said I need to change. So God, you said I need to change. I'm coming back to you now and saying, God, show me how. What can I do? What can I put in place in my life to be able to work with the, with the Holy Spirit and to be able to work with what God has said? What do I need to do practically now? See, we would all just love God to come and go, wham! And it's dealt with. Who would love that? I had, oh, mate, I've had emotional baggage from my childhood for years. I've still got stuff I'm unpacking and things I'm trying to deal with from the way that my life being raised. I've got a friend of mine called Samantha. She was, she's worse than me. Like, you know, she had a whole bunch of stuff, way worse than I ever had growing up. And I remember being in a tent one day in a worship session. I'm there. She's three rows behind me about where Brendan is. She's got her hands out like this. And here's what happened. You can believe it or not. I saw it with my own eyes. Something picked her up, and in hindsight, I know it was God, picked her up and threw her three rows of chairs backwards. She just flew from a standing start in a worship session like this. Her body lifted up. She flew three chairs backwards, landed with the small of her back on the top of the chair, bent like a pretzel, bounced forward, bang, landed on the dirt, because we were in a tent outside, hit the ground, burst into uncontrollable laughter. I spent the next year and a half with that girl in Australia, plus overseas in India doing mission stuff, walking closely with her every day. And from that moment, she was instantly set free of all this stuff. And I'm going, God, I've got to go through a life of counsellors and this and that. Why can't you just throw me over a chair? We would all just love that moment where God just takes it and goes, whammo, and we go, yeah. But for most of us, our breakthrough is not going to come that way. We've got to participate, don't we? We've got to do the work. I wish we all got a Samantha job, but we just don't, you know? So here's the thing. God doesn't give miracles to everybody, but he promises wisdom to everybody. But you've got to ask. Amen? It's a promise, but you've got to do your part. Ask. So prayerfully, sit down and ask God, is there someone I can start talking to, Lord? Is there a book I can get a hold of and read? Is there a podcast I can listen to? Is there a habit I need to start? Is there a habit I need to replace? Is there a course I can do? Is there an app I can download? I don't know, technology's probably got all kinds of things out there. Is there a group that I can join? Is there a place I need to go? Is there a place I need to stay away from? Are there thoughts I need to stop entertaining? Is there a decision I need to make? What is it practically, Lord? I'm not telling you what it is. Get with God, who gives generously wisdom to all without finding fault. Ask God. When we do what we know we can do, it opens the door for God to do what only he can do. And Sometimes I think God's sitting there going, I want to get involved in this, but I'm not going to do all the work for you. I'm going to bring the walls of Jericho down but I've told you to march around it and scream. <laughs> told you to walk around seven times. One time a day for six days, and the last day I told you to walk around seven times and then go, <laughs> and if you do that, I'll do what you can't. I'll tear them walls down, brick by brick. But you've got to do your bit. You've got to do your bit. What is it that God is saying? What have you got to do? We do the natural, and God does the supernatural. Number four, real quick. Next thing is, once you've got a list, now take the first step. Actually do something. Actually go and do something. So many people make plans. Write it down. And do nothing with it. Write the vision down. Well, it's pointless. You can write whatever you want down. It's pointless if no one does anything with it. So once you've written it down, actually take the first step. What's the first thing you can do? Can you do something today if God's spoken to you? Can you get on that phone straight after the church service and ring somebody? Can can you get online and order? Can can you look for a course? Can you go and talk to... Can you ask for prayer? What what can you do? What's the first step? Because here's the thing. It's one of my favorite verses, Psalm 37, 23. New King James Version puts it this way. It says, The steps of a good man or woman. Steps of a good person are ordered by the Lord. And he delights in his way. What I love about that is this. God loves steps. God gravitates to movement, not intentions. And people have the best of intentions to change, but they don't do anything about it and wonder why they don't change. Wonder why they're not feeling the momentum of the Spirit of God behind them. 
urging them, pushing them in that right direction because God is waiting for you to take a step. God is drawn to movement, not just intentions. Intentions won't change your life. You've got to do something with the intentions. So write it down prayerfully. But then once you've got uh, something you can do, you've got to take that very first step. And lastly, number five. When you fall, fall forward. You are going to slip up. You're going to slip up. You're going to, have, you're going to be heading in this direction. You're going to get so excited at a day or two or a week or a month, some breakthroughs, and you feel like it. And then something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. And you're going to be tempted to tell yourself, oh, I was never free. Oh, I'll never, I'll never get out of this. Oh, I'll never. And you'll be tempted to take yourself and place yourself right back at the start where you began this journey on the 31st of, of December 2023, which was the day we put those things in the box. Micah, chapter 7, verse 8. This little obscure prophet had these words of wisdom for you. He said, Do not gloat over me, my enemy. Though I have fallen, I will rise. I will get back up. I'm going to stumble, but I'm going to fall forward. And when I do, I'm going to get back up, I'm going to wipe the dust off, and I'm going to keep moving forward from the place that I fell. I'm not going to allow myself to tell myself that I'm all this way back. No, I'm not. I'm exactly where I was when I fell. I'm going to get up, wipe off the dust, and I'm going to make the decision to keep moving forward. Proverbs 24, 17. For though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again. I, 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 I love, I, I think it's in the, I can't remember which gospel it is. But there's a, a passage where Jesus says to, uh, to Peter, he says, Peter, um, you're, you're going to deny me. Four rooster crows are going to deny me. And he says this, he says, but when you come back, feed my sheep. You ever read that passage? It's almost like Jesus was saying to him, here's the thing, Peter, I've got this amazing plan for your life. You are going to become uh, this real pillar in the church. When I'm gone, you're going to become, you're going to preach the first sermon and thousands of people are going to... Right? That, that's, that's who you are. That's who you're going to be. That's what's going to happen. But here's what's also going to happen between now and then. You're going to fall. You're actually going to deny me. You're going to turn your back on me. Rooster's going to crow. I know you're here saying everyone else will, but I'm the man. I won't. Jesus says, I already know that you will. But I haven't changed my plan for your life. I already know you're going to fall. But I know also, because you're a righteous man, you'll get back up. And you'll keep moving forward. And you'll keep moving forward. And you'll keep moving forward. And that's what we've got to tell ourselves. Prepare for the fact that it's not all going to be smooth sailing and you are going to have some moments where you are going to kind of fall back and you are going to fall short. But guess what? It's not the end of the road. Don't give in to those things. So here's the thing. Here's the reality. This is the end of our four weeks on where we need to change. Okay? What I'm going to do is I'm going to sit up here at the end of the service and um, if you want your letter back, come. I'll get them out because I don't want people grabbing other people's just uh, to be safe. We'll have one of the leaders sitting here and they're all in envelopes and we told you to put your name on it, remember? So if you want it back, they can give it back to you. My encouragement to you is keep that letter. Keep it. Keep it. Put it somewhere and each month go back over and have a look and keep yourself on track with this area that you felt like you needed to change. Because we're about to finish the four-week series on where we need to change. But the fact is it's actually the beginning of your journey now. Now it's actually the beginning of the actual practical journey what are you actually going to do what are you actually going to do are you going to see it through or are you just going to go that's four weeks out of the way now move on if you do you're going to hit the end of 2024 and you won't be any further advanced or any more free of that and it won't be because God hasn't spoken to you won't be because God hasn't given you some motivation won't be because you don't understand the power of accountability won't be because you don't understand that there's going to be pain involved. It won't be because you don't understand you're probably going to fall short occasionally. It won't be because you, you haven't come up with a plan. It won't be because you didn't know you had to actually do something. All those excuses will be taken away. And now it's between you and God. Amen? So what I want to do this morning, we'll finish up. We've gone a little bit over time uh, than what we normally do. Hey, we've got tea and coffee next door and some morning tea and jazz out there. So uh, don't feel like you've got to run off. You want to run through the doors there. Have some tea, coffee, have a chat. Uh, pray with one another, talk about you know, what God's doing in your world, whatever. But what I want to do this morning, I'm just going to open up the front. And we prayed for the letters and all that jazz, but what I'd love to do this morning is if there's anybody here and you would like prayer, personally, because we, we haven't prayed for you, we've prayed for you through that, but I'd love to just pray with you personally this morning if you, if you want that. If you don't want one of us to pray for you, why don't you grab somebody here and say, look, would you pray for me, please? I just would love prayer now because the hard work begins now. Amen? 
Hard work starts now, so I want someone to pray with me. So what we'll do is we'll get some, uh, uh, wait up here if you want the envelope, just come on up, we can give it to you. Come up the front if you'd like prayer from one of the leaders or somebody. Uh, If not, grab prayer from anybody else, it doesn't really matter. But right now, the hard work starts, amen? But it's going to be worth it to get to the end of 2024 and go, you know what, I beat that thing. Me and God, we got on top of that. And guess what, in 2025, that thing's not an issue in my life anymore. Imagine what your life's going to feel like and what you can do when that thing is out of the way and no longer holding you back. Amen? So, Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for this morning. God, I want to thank you for your word. God, I want to thank you for everything that you've spoken to every person in this room. Lord, you spoke four weeks ago. The very last day of 2023, you spoke into people's spirits. You spoke to people. And you said to them, you need to change in this area. You need to break through. You need deliverance. You need healing. You need wholeness in this area of your life. God, you, Holy Spirit, Heavenly Father, Creator of heaven and earth, you spoke that. A preacher didn't speak it. A person didn't just come up with it. Uh, God, we didn't, we're not talking about what we want to. God, this is something that the holy, holy God that we just sang about, that's something that you spoke to us. And Father, we know that you would never tell us to go on a journey by ourselves. You walk with us, Lord, and you empower us. And so, Father, I just pray right now for each person here, Lord. God, when we're not talking about this stuff directly every week, that, Lord, they would grow a hold of it and they would continue, Lord, to take responsibility and run after freedom and deliverance, God, in these areas of their life. And I pray, God, at the end of 2024, I pray that this room would be full of people that can look back to the first four weeks of this year and go, man, what happened in those first four weeks, the journey that I began, and I walked with God, and I persevered, and I pushed, and I kept going, and when I felt I got back up, I'm free, I'm delivered, I'm whole, and I'm healed. God, I look forward to those testimonies in this place, Father, in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Amen.